So every so often an idea will pop into my head. Whether that's a good idea or not will remain to be seen, but every so often I do these kind of videos where I try and figure out what went wrong for a particular driver. Right place, wrong time, didn't get the support they needed, they were born at the wrong time, and so on. I think I've done about, what, three of these videos now? The first was about Giancarlo Fisichella and how he was seemingly always the best driver in a mid-tier car, but the moment he got a chance to shine in a good one, he couldn't keep it up. The same can be said for Heinz Harold Frentzen, a driver who needed a friendly hand on his shoulder, and he was always going to get that at Jordan or Sauber, but at Williams where he was expected to finally show what he was capable of, he only had one win in the best car on the grid to show for it. And the third is David Coulthard, a driver who was pretty decent but knew his limits. He knew that he wasn't going to be a world champion, because the guy in the other McLaren was Mika Hakkinen, who would be a two-time world champion in 98 and 99, while there was another driver on the grid called Schumacher, and he was apparently really good as well. So continuing on with this on-again, off-again mini-series that was intended to be a monthly thing, but hasn't been a monthly thing for about three months now, we're going to look at a driver who is a bit more recent, and that driver is Sebastian Vettel, because he'd gone to Ferrari to big fanfare to try and bring them back to the front but ended up falling off the boil entirely. So what went wrong for him? Because it always seemed like an emotional roller coaster. He'd get close to winning the world championship, but then he would just choke. At least it seemed like he choked two years running. And a four-time world champion just falling off like he did? I don't think anybody had ever seen that kind of thing before. Vettel switching from bluey purple to red was seen as an interesting move back when it happened. After winning four titles on the spin in Adrian Newey designed cars that had, for a time, every aero trick in the book, his 2014 was lacklustre, being convincingly beaten by new teammate Daniel Ricciardo. So he looked for a change of scenery, and with Alonso going back to McLaren for 2015, there was a spot open at Ferrari, and Vettel took on the challenge of going there and doing with them what his hero the Michael had done with them. There was an opportunity there to do what Alonso had failed to do win a title with Ferrari, the first driver since 2007 and first constructor since 2008. And in 2010 and 2012, Alonso in a Ferrari had been beaten to a world title, but only just. By Sebastian Vettel, ironically. And with the way the Renault engine was performing early on in the turbo hybrid era, it was safe to say if Vettel was going to win anything more than one or two races a season, he needed to go somewhere where it could potentially happen on a more regular basis. The 2014 Red Bull just wasn't there. It still won a couple of races in Ricardo's hands, but some drivers just don't get along with certain regulations. Damon Hill couldn't get his head around the groove tyres, for instance. And at the start of that new relationship, it clicked. At least it seemed like it had clicked, because Vettel won in only his second race with Ferrari, at the home of Mercedes' title sponsor, and in a car that wasn't anywhere near a championship contender. But the engine in his Ferrari was a damn sight better than the Renault in the Red Bull, with Christian Horner and Helmut Marko starting the we'll quit if you don't change the rules to make us more competitive thing. Ferrari would finish that season second in the constructors' standings. Way behind Mercedes, it has to be said, but Vettel's results were impressive. I've put them on your screen for you. This includes the three wins he got in Malaysia, Singapore and Hungary, the latter being quite a poignant victory given that the win came just days following the death of Jules Bianchi. Someone you might argue would have been in one of the two Ferraris right now had he not had that accident. He also slaughtered Raikkonen that year, 128 points I think was the gap, so it was an absolutely huge gap between the two drivers, even though they were third and fourth in the constructor standings. By comparison, there was only, what, 15 or so between Bottas and Massa? So next year should be Ferrari's year, right? No, because Ferrari would be into second by Red Bull, and Vettel would be fourth, behind Ricardo, The only emulation he did of Schumacher that year was having his engine blow up on the formation lap of the Bahrain Grand Prix. He did get some second places, but that was it. Verstappen and Ricardo were the only two drivers other than Hamilton and Rosberg to win a Grand Prix. But next year will be Ferrari's year, right? Ferrari won the 2017 Australian Grand Prix as the F1 regulations switched to the wider, more aggressive cars, with massive tyres and bigger wings. Not only would Vettel win the opening Grand Prix in Australia, he'd also win in Bahrain, and finish a close second in Russia, and then win in Monaco. Vettel would be top of the standings for the first 12 rounds of the season, but he didn't help himself on one occasion where he clanged into Hamilton, believing that the then three-time champion had brake tested him behind the safety car. And it was the second piece of unchained Vettel in as many years, because the season before in 2016 at the Mexican Grand Prix, he'd done the here's a message for Charlie thing. Oh god, I'm ill. Vettel would win one more race that season before it started to go downhill for him and for Ferrari. 
I don't know if it's fair to say the ball was dropped because that implies everything that happened was due to somebody bottling it. But at Singapore, at the first ever wet Singapore Grand Prix, Vettel had shifted across the track to try and defend from Verstappen and unwittingly sandwiched the Red Bull between himself and Raikkonen. It gifted the win to Hamilton as the Mercedes was off the pace all weekend and never looked like being on for the win. But it was an easy 25 points overhauled for Lewis as Vettel wasn't going to score. He was out of the race by turn two. In Malaysia, he'd finished fourth, two places down on Hamilton, but then at Suzuka, a dodgy spark plug took him out of the race. Another easy 25 points for Hamilton, and Vettel was then second behind Lewis at Cota. Hamilton would finish ninth at the Mexican Grand Prix with Vettel fourth, but Lewis was the four-time world champion. Equal on titles with Seb. So next year would definitely be Ferrari's year, right? The fight for five, as they called it. Vettel started 2018 in the same way he'd started 2017 by winning the season opener and doing it with a clever bit of strategy behind the virtual safety car. He'd then win again in Bahrain while it took Hamilton until Baku, the fourth round of the 2018 season, to win a race. But because Vettel had such a terrible Chinese Azerbaijan and Spanish Grand Prix, finishing 8th, 4th and 4th, Hamilton actually entered the Monaco Grand Prix 18 points in the lead. Vettel's issues at the Chinese Grand Prix weren't his fault though, because in that race he'd been tipped around by Verstappen. By Canada though, Vettel was back to winning ways, although suspicions had been raised. It was at this race Ferrari debuted their new engine, and they'd somehow managed to do about two years development in a few months, because the engine had this weird sort of boost that was quite visible on camera at around the 130-140 mile an hour mark. But I've done an entire video on that already, so we're just going to move on. Seb would then win the British Grand Prix, helped partially by Raikkonen accidentally tagging Hamilton at Turn 3. But then came the German Grand Prix. Vettel on pole, Hamilton suffering hydraulic failure and having to start 14th. You'd think then all he'd have to do is drive. That 8 point gap Vettel had after Silverstone should easily increase. But that's not what happened. Rain came during the race and Vettel was still out there, but he clanged a curb on lap 46 and knocked a tiny piece of his front wing off. On lap 52, the Ferrari was seen to slide straight off at the banked hairpin near the end of the lap as he'd locked the rear brakes. Hamilton, despite starting 14th, won this race. Although, on another day, he might not have done, because this was the race where he was coming into the pits. Then he wasn't coming in, then he was coming in, then he wasn't coming in again. In, 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 that one. Many would say that this was the beginning of the end. Vettel had a prime opportunity to extend his championship lead, but instead he'd slid off the road. Sources say he locked the rear brakes. Perhaps he'd shifted the balance back for the dampening track and overcooked it. Either way, it was an error that set the rest of the season in motion. The final win for Vettel in 2018 came at Spa, with the allegations surrounding Ferrari's engine still running rampant. Vettel passed Hamilton on the Camel Straight, and that was it. Race over, pretty much. But it was Italy where it was going to go from bad to worse. Seb was already miffed that Ferrari had given the toe to Raikkonen in qualifying. Seb had a championship to win, but they said it would be Seb that would give the slipstream to Kimi, and as a result, Kimi got pole. Vettel was thinking it should have been him on pole, as he had to overhaul a championship gap of 17 points that Lewis had opened up. Ferrari was in a state of flux at this time. Sergio Marchioni had died in the July of 2018, and Maurizio Rivabene was under pressure to deliver results. As a result of this pressure, you'd also got Mattia Bonotto looking to get a top job within the Ferrari operation, but we'll get to all of that in a minute. On the opening lap of the Italian Grand Prix, Vettel went hard, early. He tried to overtake Kimi into the first chicane, but that just allowed Hamilton to take advantage. Lewis went to the outside of the second chicane, but Vettel just clipped the Mercedes and spun round, sending him to the back of the field. Hamilton would battle Raikkonen for the whole Grand Prix and would win, with Kimi in second. Vettel would recover to fourth, which was by virtue of Verstappen getting a penalty for causing a collision with Bottas. This is where a lot of people start the whole Pronto Seb Spinale meme from, but in reality, the spinning had been happening before this. The ones I can find I've put up as a handy infographic, and this wasn't a common occurrence, but more to say that Seb had been doing this in practice sessions for a time, and it was now creeping into his racing. Fair play to him though, he didn't hit the barrier once in all of these incidents. There's probably more, but these are the ones I can find. Most of them are also in practice sessions rather than races. After that Italian Grand Prix though, the title was effectively Hamilton's and he'd actually win the 2018 championship by a bigger margin than he did in 2017. In 2017 it was something like 40 points, but in 2018 it was like 88 points. But behind the scenes at Ferrari, things were starting to get even more political. It's no secret that Ferrari, internally, is one massive political squabble. 
There always seems to be some sort of desire for power, or some sort of game of trying to reach the top. It's as if The Sopranos and Formula One had some sort of weird crossover episode. Behind the scenes, Arriva Bene had openly slated Mattia Binotto, who was the technical director at that time, for the lack of upgrades brought to the Japanese Grand Prix. Arriva Bene was trying to stay at the head of the team, while Binotto was looking to move into that position. Meanwhile, this would have likely left Seb sitting there going, uh, lads? Um, yeah, hi, uh, I would greatly appreciate it if I had some help here. You lot can fight this out at the end of the season. So that frustration bubbles onto the track. First is the error at the German Grand Prix, then the Italian Grand Prix, and then everything after that, like at Suzuka where Vettel spun. To have had a fairy tale start to your Ferrari career only to see it fall apart when you're agonizingly close. But surely 2019 will be Ferrari's year. Arriva Bene has been sacked, Bonotto is now the team principal, and now Sebastian's got himself a new teammate, Charles Leclerc. Leclerc would win two races for Ferrari in his debut season, winning the Belgian Grand Prix on the weekend Antoine Hubert was killed, and then winning the Italian Grand Prix after that. I remember those two races getting some Tifosi quite giddy, because the last person to win the Belgian and Italian Grand Prix in their first season for Ferrari was Schumacher, and they hoped that history would repeat itself. 2019 was also another year for Ferrari and Ify engines. Leclerc would win races while Vettel would win none, although that Canadian Grand Prix will no doubt be debated in the comment section. And it was clear that Ferrari had their boy. They had their guy that they wanted to put all their time into, because Leclerc was a Ferrari guy and had been since he was young. Vettel's relationship with Ferrari was more emotional. Vettel had gone to Ferrari to emulate his hero. That's fine, Hamilton wanted to do the same at McLaren, win in a McLaren like his hero Senna. At the same time, there's a queue of drivers who would love at some point to race for Ferrari, because there's the prestige and there's the clout. They're the longest serving and most successful team in Formula 1 after all. It's the same as any budding basketballer wanting to play for the Lakers, or anyone playing football wanting to play for Manchester United. But, and I'm sorry to make the comparisons once again to football, but Ferrari in the Schumacher days was like Manchester United under Alex Ferguson. Fergie had a way of shielding his players from the press, and anyone that wanted to speak to them had to go through him first. He protected his players every single time, and ruled with an iron fist. Schumacher had those same protections from Todd and Braun. Todd and Braun were also winning, which kept the bosses at Ferrari happy. Marchioni, meanwhile, was demanding results and putting a lot of pressure on the team. When he died, that opened the floodgates for certain individuals to try and make their move. And in a way, Vettel had those same protections at Red Bull. Remember how after Turkey 2010, Red Bull management blamed it all on Weber without blaming it on Weber? Vettel was their focus. Red Bull had their operation revolving around their boy. Protect him at all costs, wrap him in cotton wool, let him do what he has to do when he's on track. Red Bull would later do the same with Verstappen. Now look what's happening. We saw this in the Frentzen video. He needed that help, he needed that friendly arm around his shoulder, he needed to be guided in the right direction. Frank Williams and Patrick Head weren't going to give him that kind of help. They weren't those kinds of people. It was, you know, figure it out yourself. We're not your parents. It's probably why the likes of, you know, Mansell, Prost, and guys who had very strong personalities got on quite well there. Someone like Frentzen wasn't going to last 20 minutes. Unlike at Red Bull, Vettel wasn't going to get that same protection at Ferrari. Ferrari had too much infighting. Another power struggle was going on and Vettel is in the middle having to do more than he should have had to do. He'd been dumped in a political firestorm and it was distracting from the racing. On top of this, he had to fight a Mercedes team that had Nicky Lauda and Toto Wolff at the top keeping everything in line. They were almost robotic in their way of doing things, and it left Hamilton in that similar position that Vettel had at Red Bull, where all he had to do was get in the car and get on with it. So the other team, with the best driver at the time being metronomic and rarely putting a foot wrong, while your team is a political shit show, it all adds up. It just was not going to happen, and if you don't know how to handle all that, then you're never going to handle that. So it must have come as a bit of a kick in the head when in 2020 Ferrari told Seb that his services were no longer needed. He'd be out at the end of the season. Carlos Sainz would replace him and, well, Seb was off to Aston Martin. In his Beyond the Grid interview he said, I mean, I think I never felt that sort of extra pressure being a Ferrari driver. If anything, I felt the extra pressure that I had an expectation to myself that I want to succeed in this place, and I want to make things work. There are plenty of reasons why I didn't, why it might not have worked, but in the end, I think I'm still very happy and at peace with what we achieved. But sure, looking back, it probably did take a while to sort of recover. 
I had a lot of fun. I think I have a very strong emotional connection to Italy, the people of Italy, and to Ferrari as a brand. But I have no regrets and lots of things that I learned and I wouldn't go back and change anything. 14 wins for Ferrari in that time is nothing to be sneered at, at a time when, as mentioned, he had to go up against the well-oiled Mercedes machine. But him leaving Ferrari started his redemption arc. He'd gone from the cocky little bastard we love to hate at Red Bull through his Ferrari years where he wanted to be Schumacher, and then became the Obi-Wan Kenobi type when he realised that it was just not to be. And that's the mark of a great sportsman, knowing when it's time. Maybe Seb could have done better if he had the support like he got at Red Bull, if he'd been treated like Leclerc had done. Many of us might not have liked how he was coddled at Red Bull and protected by Horner and Marco at the expense of Weber, but you got to admit, it worked. But I'd like to know what you all think. Where did it all go wrong for Seb at Ferrari? Let me know in the comments. So then, a look at reasons why it all seemed to go horribly wrong for Sebastian Vettel after the 2013 season. If this thing has made you think things about the thing, then like this thing so the algorithm can do its thing. And for more things like this, subscribe and get the bell on to get more things from the channel. Massive thanks to the rad lads of Patreon for the support, and if you want to help with the picture purchasing piggy bank, you can find a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and affiliate links. Well, there's super thanks down there if you want to leave a tip. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.